Uh, we can now uh, begin. Uh, Alex Kainan was our mentor. He taught us and showed us that uh, science policy is a serious matter. It's not something that you can just freely talk about and form impressions, make statements based on a superficial first impression or your wishful thinking. There are many parameters involved. There are causes and consequences. There are different partners. There is an international arena. And all that has to be taken into account when you form a science policy or when you form your own opinion on judgment on a specific issue in that framework. When the Academy of Science about two years ago in this very room celebrated Alex Kainan's 90th birthday, we had a lovely luncheon here and everybody talked about Alex with love and appreciation and at the end there was a very special gesture announced honoring him, very much appropriately honoring him. That was the initiative of our uh, National Academy of Science, supported by the American Academy of Science, to give Alex a gift, a present. And the present was the funding of the project of science policy symposia Alex Kainan then decided that the first such symposium would be devoted to the study, to a certain survey, evaluation of these excellence centers in science. And that was, to a large extent, uh, uh, promoted or uh, catalyzed by this policy that we just heard about from Professor Trachtenberg, the i course, and uh, until then, excellence, of course, was used by everybody. Uh, but then the centers, the excellence centers, became a household word in our community here. People, some people praised these initiatives, others criticized it, and it was very important for Alex and his out for the whole community uh, to uh, really have some systematic thinking about what that means. What are the criteria? How do you establish? How do you select? What does it mean for the university culture or for the culture in academia to single out? You have hundreds of researchers. You have many groups until Yesterday, we thought that all of them do excellent science. And suddenly, you single out a few and tell them you are the excellent. So what does it mean? And I know that he, he started to think about it. Dr. David Friedman was supposed to, is here, supposed to coordinate it. He is over there. He asked me to join the committee. I know that, I don't know if he already asked, but I know that he intended to ask Zev Tadmor and, and Joshua Yortner, and there were a few others. Uh, then, uh, then he was ill, and when he was confined to his apartment, uh, after between the hospital and his death, we had a few opportunities just to come and, and started to talk about it. And he started, he thought that the first step should be an international mm -hmm. comparative framework, an international context. He said a list of people to correspond with. I believe that had he been alive, and that committee would really, would really start, then what we are going to do today, maybe even the same people, maybe a few others, but this kind of a format would be a first session of such a, of such a committee. 
on. Uh, so in, in that sense, it is the most befitting, befitting way to, to do this, to have this symposium uh, paying tribute to the memory of Alex. So the way we shall proceed, we now, we here have four distinguished, experienced members of the international commu community. They will offer something between the universal and the particular. There are these universal criteria for excellence, but every country due to the specific structure and historical uh, reasons and, and, uh, uh, and public culture have a specific particular application of those universal things. The way we shall proceed now is every one of the panelists, I shall introduce them one by one so that you will not forget. Every one of the panelists will walk over there, have a 15 minutes presentation after the four presentations, I shall lead a discussion between them and between them and all of you. So our first presenter is Professor uh, Niels, Christian Nielsen from Denmark, and he is the director of the Interdisciplinary Nanoscience Center and the director of Center for Insoluble Protein Structures, and from 2012, well, he has been heading the Danish Center for Ultra High Field Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy at Aarhus University. He's active in research policy and has been member of numerous board, research councils, academies, and research. And he will share with us his experience on that. Please. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure being here. I think it's a very important theme. What I'll talk about, uh, or from the perspective I'll take today, is I'll uh, try to discuss uh, first uh, my experiences with setting up a center of excellence uh, in Denmark, uh, combining five groups into to, 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 to sort of 70 uh, people with a yearly budget of one and a half million uh, dollars here. That will be the first part of what I'll talk about. So my experience as a researcher having a center of, uh, of, of, of uh, excellence, uh, how it's funded, and these things. The next one I'll go into is how to set up a much larger uh, uh, excellence center that is consisting, in this case, of 450 people here with a yearly budget of uh, around $30 million uh, here. So that is two different kinds of approaches here I'll try to describe. So we are located in Denmark. Uh, we are here. We are in Aarhus, uh, that is uh, in uh, Denmark here. We have Aarhus University, that's mapped here. We are a country that is very similar to the, to the size of Israel. We have sort of the same focus on science. Uh, we fo focus, uh, have the focus that science is a sort, of, uh, uh, res sort of a big driver for our, our uh, welfare. So we have uh, uh, around 3%, a little bit less than the, of the grand national product going into science. Basically, our science is externally funded. Obviously, we have the university funding, but most of the sort of uh, people you hire uh, for your groups and, and, and your running costs is coming from external funding. So this is extremely important. Another thing that is important is the balance between basic science and applied science. So this is sort of part of, of what I'll go, go into. So in Denmark, there's a number of different research bodies here. There's national research funds uh, that provide uh, a big portion of funding, but you also have private funds, and obviously you also will have uh, European funds. All of these, in principle, provide uh, possibilities for excellence, but I think I'll head out, hi highlight here uh, the Danish National Research Foundation, that is a foundation like the i that really supports centers of excellence. And also, I'll say that the ERC on the European scale is uh, excellent in this regard here. But we shouldn't disregard the private funds that is coming more and more in, also contributing to uh, fund uh, excellence science. So now, if we take the focus on this na national, uh, Danish National Research Foundation here, that is a foundation for excellence. That is the only topic it has to address. That is, select the excellent researchers here and provide them funding. So the core mission there is to, to provide funding for innovative research here to, by the best people here, independently on the area they are in. So it is a sort of money allocated to uh, the, the, the strong researchers here. And uh, it is curiosity driven, so it is basic research. But what I'll try to describe a little bit later on, that goes fine hand in hand also with 
applied science and also with a, a, a gain to society in terms of patents and these things. So they have a, a spend of uh, 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 around uh, uh, 50 million euros uh, per, per, per year. It was starting in 93, and 77 centers has been established on this, uh, from this uh, foundation here. So what they do is that they select the centers on basis of the center leaders. So the center leaders has an enormous power in these centers. This is explicitly them that runs the centers here. They put it for highly ambitious research here, so there's also chances taken in these they are very focused on preparing the next generation. They're focused on good leadership. And there's no fixed fund, a, a formula on how they, we can establish these centers. So we can actually establish it as we want. It should have an international profile. That is also something that is important. Either, each of these centers is funded by something like 8 to $15 million over a period of up to 10 years. Typically, they're granted for five or six years in the start. And then they are re evaluated, and then the best of them is continuing for another period. So it's an all, all 10 year program, and then you get this kind of money here. Every year? No, in total. In total. So you have something uh, like $1 million, $1.5 million per year to, to spend. So the one I have been running is a center called Center for Insoluble Protein Structures here. I'm not going so much in detail with the, with, 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 the, with, the, with the science in it if we don't have the time for it. But our focus here has been to do structural biology on what we call insoluble proteins, that is proteins residing in membranes and amyloid fibrils, <laughs> extracellular matrix proteins, things that has been difficult to study by traditional means. For this to be realized, we need to combine and set up a critical mass that allows us to do the protein chemistry, to do the chemistry that is involved in this, also to do the characterization. So we need to establish a critical mass. So what we have established here is different disciplines we have tried to combine here, protein chemistry, chemical synthesis, biophysical analysis, structural analysis, and a sample number of people here, not only funded by this center here, but also funded by supplementary funding here. So I think what is important here, these centers here allows us to set up critical mass. So this is an important issue. Another issue that is important is this allows us to set up uh, core facilities that allows us to span interdisciplinary research here, again, spanning from uh, different disciplines here. You need instrumentation, you need labs, you need infrastructures here. So this is very important to use the funding for this kind of purposes also. Even the funding has been applied here to generate also the basis for establishing something like a Danish Scandinavian ultra high field NMR cell that we've got $7 million uh, granted for this purpose also. So that means eventually we can gear, we can try to gear these things and try to expand it into the future here, playing a major role for NMR-based, in this case, NMR-based structural biology, not only in Denmark, but also in Scandinavia, coupled to international research programs. And this is sort of inspired, at the, for, formed the basis uh, of that is formed from the grant from the National the Danish National Research Foundation. So what we do, and again, I'll not, not uh, go into too much details here, what we do is that we combine structural analysis here with organic chemistry in this case here, in this case here to sort of design potential alternatives to small uh, molecule uh, antibiotics. And that means essentially we can also go into societal things, not only providing basic science, but we can also provide it uh, uh, as, as gearing to something that is applied. Other things that we are looking into is uh, early stage de de detection of dementia. Again, that is fundamental science here. We need structural biology. We need to design molecules that binds to amyloid fibrils that is characteristic for Alzheimer's disease here. And eventually, we hope that we can design some early stage diagnosis methods. Again, something that hopefully uh, go into the future as something that is uh, sort of important. Another thing we're focusing on is uh, structural biology in uh, native biological systems, not only taking out proteins and biological molecules and isolating these, but really st uh, uh, studying them in their native environments, in this case, uh, the photoreceptor systems in green sulfur bacteria here. This insight here can be used to inspire artificial solar cells. So there's also societal impacts here. You can ask, has a center of this kind been a success? Well, I don't know, we shouldn't quantify it, but uh, there has been uh, 444 publications so far in international uh, uh, peer reviewed uh, journals. There has been 270 PhD theses, masters and, uh, and, and uh, bachelor's theses here. There's also been out companies here that has been a substantial gearing of funding by other funding bodies here, and eventually also led into the next thing I'll talk about, namely a larger uh, 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 interdisciplinary research centers. 
One thing I want to put into the discussion here today, there's a lot of discussion in the societies whether you should invest in basic research or applied research. I'll not say I have the clue to what you should do or not do, but I think it's interesting to note that this the Danish National Research Foundation here that's only focuses on centers of excellence, they use 2% of the natural, uh, public spending on research in Denmark. Yet, they have uh, uh, contributed 15% of all papers in top journals, so that's excellence. Two thirds of these was awarded uh, EIC grants, that's also a success. But what is perhaps the most striking success, 16% of all patents comes out from this kind of investments here. So that means you invest 2% here, you get 16% of the patents. So actually this goes hand in hand, and that is what we're trying to actually uh, provide uh, uh, information on. So what is good is not, we shouldn't say basic research or, or, or not, but we should do both. And what should be distinguished is excellent science uh, uh, relative to good science or less good science, and you should select the right talents. The next thing I'll just use five minutes on is try to illustrate that obviously you can set up centers of excellence by national funding. You get a specific fund for setting up a center. We set out 10 years ago to set up a center in nanoscience. That was not publicly funded. Denmark provi provided the, the, the sort of the vision they would put a big fund out, but they never did. But a lot of people worked for it, and we worked for it, and we wanted to establish a nanoscience center here that combines excellent research, education, and innovation. So what we wanted to do as all nanoscience centers is to go across different disciplines. We did that also in the Center of Excellence I presented. We wanted to go into areas that was close to what we could uh, be interested in in society, nanomaterials, nanomedicine, nanofood. And what we wanted to provide was excellence in research. It was a bottom-up process. And one can then look into it. Research requires money. We established it by basically uh, and, and, and sort of a joint venture bottom up by 25 different research groups here. Uh, we have, in uh, the time that we have had this center going, established 400, uh, $250 million in external funding, around $50 million just in 2012 here. We're heading many of these research centers. What I'm saying is that if you want to establish excellence, it's also important that you do it also on the local scale. You can establish many uh, gearing, many activities of this kind here if you really do it in the right way. And iNano has been an example of this here. Assembling a lot of centers of excellence here and providing good uh, capital to do research, as mentioned, $250 million since it was started. It established also excellence from the grounds. We established an education, a bachelor's and master's education. We have something like 200 of these students here, 50 that is admitted every year. Focusing on nanoscience, so we have also a big chain of good students into the area. We also established a graduate school with 150 PhD students involved, and that has been a tremendous success in, in, in terms of trying to establish the fundament for the new generation of scientists. These ones can be sent abroad, we can take them back. We have established also a mindset that industrial collaboration is not bad and not contradictory to science. We are working with around 100 companies we are making spin-off companies, and I think, again, this is very important for the young generation also to see that you need to make also societal impact, so industrial collaborations is of interest. We have even had the success that our university now put iNano up as a role model for investing in large research uh, 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 infrastructures here. That is institute-like centers here. We have 450 people involved in nanoscience in almost I'm directing that center at present. So they are investing in that. They, they are investing in infrastructures. They are investing in buildings. So we, in August last year, we moved into a building here, a 10,000 square meter new building, where we now assemble all this interdisciplinary research that came also out from the uh, uh, basic science uh, uh, center I talked about uh, before. Merging them together, uh, having a house like this, where we have a lot of infrastructures. And I think what is important, if we want to drive the next generation of scientists to do science in Europe or in Denmark, in this case here, we need infrastructures. So what we built is infrastructures here. We have a lot of instrumentation here. We have a lot of uh, uh, synthesis uh, uh, things here. Many of these that is sort of North European frontline uh, things. Again, people is in center. And the only way to get the good people is to have good facilities. So that has been the mission. So that's where we put the money. 
So I'll end up here and uh, sort of say, well, what are we focusing on? Well, we are focusing on, as mentioned, nanomaterials, nanomedicine, nanofood. We are making a lot of great science. We have impact in good publications. We have impact also by working with industries. Uh, we have uh, impact also in educating the next, next generation of excellent researchers here, mixing excellence with societal needs. So I'll end up, is that a success? Well, iNano has also been a success, one of Denmark's largest research centers here. It has success in excellent research, education, and innovation. It has success in fundraising and industrial interaction. It has success in establishing research infrastructures here, but also what is mostly important, educating and recruiting the young generation of people here, because again, people are those that has to drive the centers. Centers of excellence is not of any relevance if we don't have the right people. And I think also one can say politically, because we also need to put arguments to the politicians, that we can address with interdisciplinary centers of this kind here global challenges. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Just one remark before we move to the next speaker. We essentially already had three presentations of excellence initiatives or excellence centers. One, the French case for Edouard, the Israeli ICOR case from Professor Trachtenberg, and now we had a Professor Nielsen telling us about Denmark. And there is one thing that I would like to draw your attention to, that they differ. I'm not talking now about the contents and how excellence is evaluated and judged, but the three of them are very different in their format and structure. And let's continue and compare that. This will be one of the points that I suggest that we discuss. And our uh, next speaker is Professor Robert Paul Koenigs, and he is the Director General for Scientific Affairs of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. And I noticed on his, on his bio, he, from 1981 until today, he held various positions in that, in that organization. And by training, he is a mathematician. And he recently is also involved in, since the Chinese initiatives have been also uh, mentioned here in the China-German Center for the Promotion of Science. So, Professor Koenigs. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to speak at this august assembly. And I'll try and rush you through the German Excellence in Initiative. Um, yep. And try and have enough time at the end to tell you a little about the impact that we've already been able to see. And this will, in fact, be a talk more on structure than on substance. I think you need both for this kind of endeavor. So the German Excellence Initiative focuses on universities. That's important in Germany because we have um, a very diverse research system. We were not as wise as Israel in putting all our uh, basic research into universities. We have a big landscape of extramural institutes and um, a certain degree of formalization of universities similar to France. So the idea between, behind the Excellence Initiative was to put more emphasis on basic research in universities, strengthen the university system by making them internationally competitive, visible, and attractive for outstanding researchers and research students, and uh, focusing on first-class research, graduate training and research careers, and cooperation between universities and extramural institutes. Um, important maybe to see what we are not focusing on, special areas of um, that, that are considered needed or uh, necessary or cutting edge. We left that to competition. How much money was in the game? 1.9 billion euro of fresh money into the research system um, funded by the German federal government and the state's governments, the lender. That's another peculiarity about Germany. We have a federal system. So basically we have... Um, 17 separate funders in this, but um, 
it works out all right. To put that into context, that is about 2% of public spending on R&D, which is asymptotically approaching 3% of the gross domestic product, um, which is 3.5% of total spending on universities, and 22% of the budget of the DFG, the German Research Foundation, my organization, that was chosen to run the Excellence Initiative. Um, it then um, turned out there would be a second phase. The second phase had an increase of 30%, uh, so as not to only to be able to continue those in the first uh, slice that were good, but to uh, add some fresh initiatives as well. And uh, this second round started, uh, well, almost a year ago. What were the instruments? Basically three. The first instrument with about less than 20% of the funding were graduate schools. Um, I won't elaborate on that too much, but um, we had that because structured graduate education in Germany is still not really established and um, people felt it was necessary to give it a boost to have some good examples and um, uh, to, to sort of entice people in, into going that way. The second part are the clusters of excellence, which are actually the centers of excellence this meeting is, is mainly talking about, uh, on focused research topics at universities. Um, if possible, in cooperation with uh, institutes in the vicinity, but the idea is to have this at one university or in, in cases of cities where you have several universities and a cooperation of universities in that city, but regional. So we don't have um, cooperations between Munich and Hamburg and so on. This was really intended to institutionally strengthen individual universities, so um, dispersion was, was not asked for. M more than... 50% of the money goes into this, almost 60%. And the rest, which is slightly more than 25%, goes into what uh, Edouard Brezin called the ridiculous concept of uh, funding entire universities. I'm not going to contradict you. Uh, I have an example that shows that it might quite be helpful after all. Um, Here, a, a lot of the concepts come in that we've already, already heard about today. Um, we wanted them to be in original areas of research, not more of the same with more money, but original ideas, original cooperations, and um, yes, they are there to establish a critical mass. The criteria, I'll be coming to those, detailing those in a moment, are basically scientific, and the process is bottom-up. We did not set subjects beforehand, but we said just show, think of what your university could do really well and come up with that and we'll choose. Um, choosing was quite a process. We used international reviewers. Uh, we're very grateful for the response and um, it was quite, in our opinion, successful. Um, one thing about it, funding is for five years, for the possible another five years, but universities were asked to commit themselves to a continuation in some sense of these centers so that the effect didn't just peter out, but it actually had a structural effect on the university that received the grant. Uh, sorry. Now, these are the criteria. I'm not going to detail them, but as you can see, there are three main points. First, is the research original and really good? Uh, I'm trying to use the word excellent only as a proper name in the Excellence Initiative. Um, second, are the pe uh, people the right people to do this kind of thing? And is the center doing the right thing to get the people? That is, um, uh, have they got a good recruiting policy? Have they got a good... Um, research training policy, and have they got a good gender equality policy? Uh, the third criteria, sorry, um, 
third criterion is uh, structures. Um, I won't, won't uh, elaborate on that. And when uh, the initiatives came up for continuation, the criterion was, of course, how well have you done on all of these points above. So successful recruitment was really an essential criterion for continuation, for instance. The result. Um, um, as you can see, it still, or it still gives a certain thermal impression. Uh, we have 11 universities that are funded as such, as, uh, quote, excellent universities. But on the whole, uh, altogether, 44 universities benefited from one of the three funding modes of the Excellence Initiative out of a possible total of a 112. So we don't have the uh, formal concept of a research university in Germany, but in actual fact we do have a sort of grading of universities that uh, have more or less emphasis on research. Now I'd like to give you just three examples of what could have come out of this or what actually came out of this. This one is a cluster of excellence in Frankfurt, um, combining the university and two Max Planck institutes. So this is one of the aims we had to enhance cooperation between universities and Max Planck institutes who entered into this together. Um, I won't read this out because uh, it probably means more to you than to me, but um, if you look at the aims to determine, well, determine structure and function of macromolecular complexes at an increasing level of complexity, to pursue collaborative pro projects only possible in this cluster, and uh, to promote high-risk projects. That was also one of the criteria during evaluation, have these clusters taken risks? Uh, and if, did they pay out, but um, uh, you couldn't always tell. But they are encouraged to take risks, they're required to take risks, and that's what they're there for. Um, the structure of the cluster actually is, is nothing we prescribe. They, they can choose any way of co collaborating and dis <coughs> dis distributing the money they like, they have to present it and it has to seem plausible in evaluation, but there's no fixed mode that we prescribe. What do they want to do? Scientific excellence, again this is a quote, and early independence of young researchers. This is always in the foreground, getting young people into research. And uh, assigned directly to the university president. This is quite a delicate issue in universities, the uh, relationship between the clusters and the faculties because usually a, a cluster involves several faculties. They tend to be multidisciplinary. We encourage them to be multidisciplinary. And this is one way to solve it, just uh, attach it to the president's office. This is a graduate school in Dresden, in the uh, new uh, Bundesländer. And um, they have, it's based on a research program or a research area biomedicine and bioengineering, and the cell development on systems biology, regenerative medicine, molecular, molecular bioengineering, focused on graduate training. So they, they don't really get money for research, they get money for research training, um, which can include the odd new professorship. Uh, okay, this is what we call the institutional strategy, the uh, ridiculous concept of uh, funding entire universities. Um, what it is basically is um, empowering the university leadership to uh, do things with its university. Uh, university leadership in Germany is traditionally weak. The, the rector doesn't have funds. Um, it's, it's all with the faculties. And this instrument gives uh, a university, in a sense, an identity and money to carve that identity. And um, 
it's, it's debatable whether that's a good idea and whether that, this is the right way to do it. It seems fairly certain that this part of the Excellence Initiative is not going to be continued in, in any particular form. But um, I'll get back to it on the effect. So what is the impact of the Excellence Initiative that we've been able to notice so far? Uh, one of the most striking uh, results is the change of mindset in the universities and in the uh, lender funding the universities, that these are no longer sort of training institutions that they, they have to fund along with other things, but they have globally competitive and globally visible institutions they're responsible for. And the universities themselves, that they see themselves not as, uh, well, an, an institution in a certain uh, Bundesland a state of Germany, <coughs> but also as an institution that competes with its research. Um, another effect is uh, there was a long debate about the Excellence Initiative. It brought research back onto the screen of public opinion. We had a public discussion and people talked about research and funding research. And I think that's quite an important effect too. These effects are sort of have, have nothing to, at all to do with the research itself but putting it back on, on the map. Um, of course, it also, uh, and, and that is actually one of the aims that we made for, it made the German system more visible. It, it encouraged uh, universities and research groups at universities uh, to internationalize, and it attracted the interest. I mean, I'm here because um, uh, someone noticed that we have this excellence initiative. And I'll give you figures on that. It increased the attractiveness to students and researchers from Germany and abroad, and that's really what it's about, getting good people to come to Germany um, or to come back to Germany. We have, uh, not, not, not in your dimensions, but also a pr problem that our PhD students seem to be quite well trained and very... Uh, attractive to people in America, and we, let, we want to get some of them back. So, to elaborate on the positive dynamics at the university levels, they have sharpened their profiles in research, they have new interdisciplinary networks. We have a similar, uh, or had a similar geometry in Germany, that uh, Boston was closer <coughs> than um, the faculty across the road. Um, that has changed. It has targeted the promotion of young researchers. Actually, and incidentally, it also put equal opportunities, really, for, in, in gender respect, really on the map for German universities. And it led to an improvement of administrative structures. University uh, administrations were suddenly in a competition and realized actually they were there for the researchers and not the other way around. Um, it's a hard change and it isn't complete, but it has started. So some figures, um, there are 17 and a half thousand researchers employed in the clusters of excellence in the graduate schools. I'll, I'll leave out the uh, ridiculous concept, um, of which 34 are female and 25% more or less are recruited from abroad. 4,600 of these positions are new. This uh, includes the, the um, institutional structures. Most of them, of course, are PhD students, but we have 820 positions filled for postdocs and group leaders and uh, over 400 professorships. Uh, not all from abroad, of course. I, I guess that would be, again, with the professorships, maybe slightly more than 25%, but um, uh, somewhere in that range. Sorry, I got that wrong. This two, these figures, too, are also only for clusters of excellence in graduate schools. Another 1,300 positions were created in the uh, institutional strategies. And, of course, what we did get and what we really wanted was world-class research. So, thank you very much. Actually, at one present sent me, passed me a note which I would like to share with you. And he says, suggests, that speaker should specify whether excellence is a life sentence. 
In France, it's a five-year sentence, and my question to Edouard is if you can get one third off for good behavior. <laughs> anyway, in this context, I just want to mention uh, uh, something which will not be said here. I mentioned it very briefly. In Belgium, the Flemish government established about 10 years ago a, what they call a Methuselah program. Methuselah, the biblical Methuselah, Methuselah, he lived 900 years, as you know. That program has no limit. It is being evaluated every seven years in order either to change, to modify, to continue. So there are formats like that also. Now, uh, our next speaker on the panel is Professor Toshio Kuroki. And Professor Kuroki uh, is, has been uh, on, uh, the president of the Japan Cancer Association, the president of Tifu University, deputy director of the Research Center for Science Systems. He had extensive international, international connections. He was a visiting scientist at the International Agency for Cancer Research at Lyon in France. Uh, what I noticed that his uh, career for years uh, started at Tohoku University and for Tohoku University, we here have a very special uh, sentiment because in 1922, when Einstein visited Japan, he visited Tohoku University and gave there a series of lectures. So on this note, I would like to welcome Professor Kuroki and ask him to present his remarks. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for providing me uh, this unique opportunity to all the people are involved or are concerned about excellence initiative. And in Japan, we started WPI program. That means uh, World Premier Initiative or Institute, International Institute Initiative. We have started WPI initiative in 2007. Um, and what is WPI program? The background is we try to establish, a, we think, the government think, the basic research will strengthen future growth and global competitiveness. And it, in 2007, next, it's a Ministry of Education launched the WPI growth program, a highly changing, challenging, and long-term program. Long-term means for 10 years. In WPI Center, world finest brain gathered, outstanding researchers <coughs> generated, and talented young researchers are natural. And WPI Center should be globally visible and internationally open. And we have also, we, the first we are interested in basic research. This is a very important criteria for WPI because if WPI center develops some innovations, applications, we are very happy, but we are basically interested in the basic research because basic research is really basis for the future development. We have four missions, advancing leading edge research, Number two is creating breakthrough and paradigm shift by fusion of existing discipline. Number three, establishing international open center. Number four is reforming research and administration systems. And in addition, we have, um, Next. we are inter it's an additional mission is nurturing young researchers and also outreach activities. And I explain all these uh, missions in detail. Next. Uh, I skip the out, uh, outstanding research uh, going down, but it is printed in a printout. And actually, the first five years, uh, we, five WPI center published 2,005 papers. And among them, 
5.5% of papers are ranked top 1%. And this is the second place after Rockefeller Institute University. Rockefeller University published of the same period 2,500 papers and 6%, more than 6% papers are ranked top 1%. And, and the second mission is the fusion research. And we expect fusion research may create breakthroughs or paradigm shift. But we know it is not easy. And we have, a two, strat we have a two approaches for fusion research. One is a strategic fusion, or institutional strategy to fuse science. For example, mathematics and material science, mathematics and physics, particular and particle physics, immunology, imaging, and the material and cell biology. But at the same time, we think it's very important to have a bottom-up fusion, we call. Bottom-up fusions come up from through free discussions among especially young researchers or graduate students. For this, it's very important to provide opportunities to communicate freely. But however, the yield result of both such bottom-up fusions <coughs> It's unpredictable. So we have to patient to wait the result of bottom-up fusion studies. And this is one of the examples of bottom-up fusions. Um, for example, in Cabri IPMU, every afternoon, 3 p.m., the P all the researchers come down to the large room and discussing in the front of blackboard. And this is Material Science Institute in Tohoku University. They have, a, every Friday evening, they have a, a free discussions, a presentations, a posters among young researchers. And they serve after five beers and some snacks. So which is catalyzed the communication. And third missions, internationalization of, and, and frankly speaking, internationalization of Japanese universities are very, very poor. Um, in Japan, we have so many institutions and universities. But if you think about these institutions, you may think it is exclusively for Japanese people. However, we have uh, so many outstanding scientists. For example, Nobel Prize laureate may be the second or third place after 2000. And for example, University of Tokyo, ranked by QS, overall ranking 30s, but academic reputation is seventh place. However, international faculty of international students is 301 among 300 universities. So it's the lowest. It's the same for Nagoya University. Um, this is a ranking of 2008 in which an FTE, a full-time equivalent of international faculty, uh, faculty members are indicated. Harvard University is 30%, Oxford 40%, but the University of Tokyo is only 5%. So this is true, but we think WPI is a good chance to, to break through. Next, please. And for example, in the WPI centers, we have five or six at this point. In total, 45%, 344 of 761 researchers are foreigners. For example, in MANA, that is a material nanotechnology institute, 30% of PIs and 56% of staff and 86% of postdocs are foreigners. But this time, uh, our site visit team uh, mentioned MANA need more Japanese postdocs. And, and of course, organization, organizing international conference, the symposium is very important. And the use of English and support by administ administration staff and support of daily life for foreigners is very important because we have a so, so much uh, uh, barriers, language barrier, carrier barrier, 
uh, um, geographical barrier and cultural barriers. And number four mission is reform of science and administration systems. And most of the university, or well, all universities in Japan, it's everything decided by consensus-based decision making. And we have a robust faculty meeting which against every time to the leadership of president. I spent seven years in a university president. I felt uh, I had a resistance every time proposing some new ideas. And also administration staffs are inflexible. For example, we receive a letter, invitation letter from foreign country. They ask automatically to translate into English. Next. So we try to change and we ask the WPI Center to have robust leadership of center director and flexibility administrations. For example, flexible salary system, English as a working language, and joint appointment with other institutions. Next. OK, next, please. And maturing young researchers. And uh, it is very important to exposure to expose young researchers to international environment. So, and also we have a governmental systems from different disciplines. And now WPI Center, for example, covering IPMU, it's now becoming a proud step for future career for young researchers. For example, 2011 to 2012, uh, 43 postdocs, uh, 41 out of 43 postdocs get a new job at world major institutions. For example, in the Princeton University, CERN, Tokyo University, and Kyoto Universities. Next slide. Um, we have uh, some target numbers for WPI Center. 20 or more top-notch PIs, a total of 200 or more staff members. This is a core member, critical mass of researchers we need. For the internationalization, 20% of PIs are invited from abroad, 30% or more overseas researchers. And for this, the government support financially 1.35 billion yen, or 15 million US dollars a year per center. A research money is, however, research money is not included. And we support for 10 years with possible five-year extension. Two years from now, we have a now a selection of possible five years extension of five WPI centers. So I show you, I show you five w, uh, nine WPI centers. These WPI centers are categorized universe, material science, and life science. And these five WPI centers established 2007 and 2010, uh, Kyushu University established Energy Institute. And in last year, de December 2012, now uh, Institute of Tokyo Technology and Tsukuba University, Anogai University are joined. And Tsukuba University established a SRIP Institute. And Nagoya University uh, interested in the chemistry of plant physiology. And this uh, Institute of Tokyo Technology, Institute of Technology of Tokyo interested in the origin of earth and life. And so this material science and life science are very useful for the society, but us and the universe studies of these areas may be interested, but we cannot expect so much for applications, innovations. But we think these studies create a curiosity among people. And it, for example, one of the book published by Director Murayama of Kaburi IPMU has sold already 300,000 300, copies. He described about what is a universe and what is dark matter, what are dark energies. Next slide. So these are faces of center director of WPI. And we have uh, Dr. Sofronis, 
who come from Illinois University. And in life science, we have five WPI centers. And next, for material science, we have five WPI centers. Next, for us and the universe, we have two. And we also recognize the importance of mathematics. And for example, AIMR is now trying to make uh, mathematics, injection of mathematics into material science to create a new material science. That, uh, we have a very robust uh, mix. A follow-up system uh, by program co international program committee and the international uh, site of visit team consists of international working group, six specialists, among which three are from come from foreign country. Next slide. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is the outline of the WPI Center. Thank you, Professor Kuroki. And our fourth speaker on the panel is, uh, is George Klein. And uh, George will speak tomorrow again, but tomorrow he will be introduced above all as a very good friend of Alex Keynan. Uh, now I shall introduce him for his most uh, long and great career in, uh, at the forefront of research in tumor biology, in immunology, where together with his wife, Dr. Eva Klein, they made really groundbreaking contributions. What may be um, institutionally, of course, he's an elected member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, what should be pointed out here, that he is a Dr. Honoris Causa of the Weizmann Institute. And uh, because we have so many visitors from abroad, uh, Dr. Klein, like everybody else, will speak in English. Otherwise, he could have done it in Hebrew. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, well, I am a research scientist, and I know very little about science policy. Actually, most of what I know, I knew from Alex Kanan, who was a great friend. And we had these interesting committee meetings right in this building. And most of what I know about science policy, I learned then. But therefore, my talk here today will be subjective and anecdotal. Can I be heard? Yes. Uh, my first story comes from the time when I was somewhat involved in science policy, sitting on the Science Advisory Council of the Swedish government. And um, that was some 30 or 40 years ago. Our chairman was the prime minister. And the first chairman was Tage Erlander, uh, who was, as Minister of Education, essentially responsible of building the Swedish university system after the Second World War. And he was profoundly interested, listening, concentrated, and said very little. But when he said something, it was to the point. After him came Olof Palme, and that was quite different. It was uh, essentially always trying to provoke a battle, a controversy, but interesting. But each of them had their own styles. Now, at one point, we were going to listen uh, to professors at the technical universities mainly, who spoke about the decline of inventions in the course of Swedish history, which was absolutely dramatic. And um, uh, the great discoveries in industrial science, and what made Swedish industry great, was essentially in the 19th century, early 20th century, and it was due to individuals. Uh, these individuals often created enterprises, <coughs> and Swedish steel, Swedish meshes, all the important products were created by them. But these were private enterprises. Now, by the time when we discussed this in the council, private enterprise was anathema. An other word that was anathema was excellence. Actually, I learned the Hebrew word today from Professor Arnon Hitzteinut, and uh, the verb form of that would be Hitzteinut, which would then mean to excel. Now, to excel is absolutely anathema. And I can illustrate this with a later meeting we had in this council. 
uh, when two colleagues of mine, Hans Buhmann and uh, Leonard Philipson and myself, were there to convince the government that they should establish centers of excellence. It was one of the most unpleasant meetings of my life. The ministers, uh, not the prime minister, but the ministers uh, responsible for education and culture went to a frontal attack against us and said just about the following. You are elitistic. Uh, you had the good fortune of having been born to families where there were books, there was music, there was art. Uh, you got some culture. The average Swede doesn't have that. We are a nation, nation of presence uh, developing and we don't need excellence at all. You just want to perpetuate your elitistic culture. So nothing came out of our suggestion, and there are no centers of excellence in Sweden. So I thought that my talk would be very short today because it's called centers of excellence in Sweden, so my answer is there are none. Uh, nevertheless, uh, science is not that bad in Sweden, which again is due to tradition, mostly from the 19th, early 20th century. And of course, there was a tradition of originality, respect for originality, which again, I think, came, maybe have come partly from the industry. And of course, Alfred Nobel is an excellent uh, example for that. Now, Alfred Nobel, uh, when he made his will among the four walls uh, of his chamber, not consulting essentially anybody, uh, he decided to give the right to give out the prize in medicine or physiology to Karolinska Institute. Now, what was Karolinska Institute at that time? It was founded in 1810 by King Charles XIII, who was a king for a very short time. And he has just lost Finland to Russia. And his ambition was to reconquer Finland. Uh, he was very dissatisfied with the long education of army doctors given at the universities in Uppsala and Lund. So he, he established a new school in Stockholm, which is called after him the Karolinska Institute. It's not an institute, it's a school. And um, uh, th then why did Nobel give to this parvenu school the right to give the Nobel Prize? I should say that the rector of the University of Uppsala uh, when he returned from having been abroad, wrote in the annals of the university that my absence abroad was exploited to establish a rough school of felchers and barbers in Stockholm who threatened the established pillars of science. So how could Nobel choose this school? I think partly the reason was that he hated the universities of Sweden and he really wanted to teach them a lesson. Anyway, the giving out an overprice in medicine has been a double-edged sword, as I always try to point out to my colleagues. On the one hand, it has enormously strengthened uh, the knowledge of the name, but it's also very dangerous, because uh, every year we get the best lecturers in the world coming and lecturing to us, uh, virtually free of charge, and our students get very soon the illusion that they come because we are so good. We are not. They, are, they come there for a totally different purpose. They just want to show themselves, which they think will help them, but it doesn't actually. Uh, so uh, that about uh, <clears throat> the reputation of Karolinska. Uh, in reality, when you look at what ha really happened, there's a strange contrast between Sweden and Finland, because Sweden has been progressively declining over the last decades in everything. In the school system, we, have to be we used to be leading in the world uh, in secondary schools. We are now down to position 16. The country which is always number one, and uh, not always, it's uh, sometimes Finland and sometimes South Korea, but Finland is very often in the place number one. It's interesting because as Sweden has been declining, so has Finland going up. And uh, the culture in Finland and in Sweden is virtually the same, uh, with some differences. One difference is, of course, the war experiences in Finland. <clears throat> but otherwise, Finland was under Swedish rule for 700 years. And uh, they depart from the same Lutheran modesty, hesitation, uh, being very considerate, very careful, not trying to assert yourself, which again, like excellence, is a very bad word. And yet, the Finns could make it, the Swiss cannot. So what is the difference? I was, I'm trying to find this out, and of course I don't know the answer, but uh, 
I keep asking everybody I can. And I think one reason is that we do not have something which every Swede will know what it is and none of you will have ever heard of it. It's the Jante law. Maybe our Danish colleagues okay. may have heard, yes. Uh, now, Jante is not a real person. Jante is a person in a novel written actually by a Dean, Sande Musa. And this Jante is a young man who moves to a big city. Uh, not a big city, a small city. And um, he quite soon learns that this city has its special law. There are ten laws. The first law says you should not think that you are somebody. The second law says you should not think that you are better than we are. The third is you should not think that you can get anywhere in life. And there are some ten laws like that. Now, in Sweden we all know the young law. And uh, we try to behave accordingly. And we try to pretend that we are not as good as we are. And actually, to be excellent is more or less a shame. It's very impolite. By the way, and I don't want to go into details. Uh, I would like to discuss uh, at dinner with some of my Japanese colleagues that there are great similarities between Japanese and Swedish culture. <clears throat> and then Israeli sociologist Shmuel Eisenstadt has shown that in a comparative study of Japanese and Swedish culture, and it's a very interesting finding he made, namely that these are the only two cultures in the world where behavior is formalized, but in a class-independent fashion. In all other countries, formalities are class-dependent. Now, Schmuel's thesis was that this is due to the fact that both cultures have evolved from extremely violent cultures, samurai and Viking. And as they evolve towards peaceful behavior, there is a transition period where things are not very, very well established yet in behavior. And that if there are big gatherings where many people meet who don't know each other, and the men have a sword, and they, have, they often drink alcohol. It's extremely important to formalize behavior so that everybody always knows what to do and when to do. And this formalization of behavior is good for many things, keeping peace, for instance, reaching consensus, yes. But it can also be rather boring, and it's certainly not something that will favor excellence. Now, uh, in Finland, there is no Jantelo. In Sweden, there is. So how come there isn't in Finland? The explanation is probably because Finland has been wedged in between two major powers all its history, Sweden and Russia. And um, therefore, when a Finn did something, then everyone was proud. Mm -hmm. And there, is, there was no jealousy, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the same you find in Iceland today. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, going a little further than that, uh, th there is this uh, contrast in, in these in this two countries. And what, of course, I would like to emphasize as I go on is the sociology of excellence. I think the sociology is all important. And we all know about the creative foci that have certainly reason. The Pasteur Institute was mentioned today, Lvov, Mono, and Jacob. Uh, they have always con been considering themselves as the exception in science. And um, when de Gaulle announced that the, the Nobel Prize to them was a triumph for French science, then Monod, who was a Huguenot, said that not at all. We could have never done anything with French support. All we could do is, was because of NIH support. And so <laughs> de, Gaulle, de Gaulle did not invite him. He invited the other two. Uh, the sociology, again, is, 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 as I say, all important. The other creative centers, <coughs> the MRC lab in, in Cambridge, from which so many Nobel Prizes came, uh, or MIT, or Harvard, and so on. But creative um, environments, um, as Hans Krebs, a Nobel laureate in biochemistry, has said, uh, are like an enzyme. Uh, they can work extremely rapidly and with great precision, but they are very sensitive to small doses of poison. And I would like to bring up what the poisons are tomorrow when I speak at the Kenan uh, meeting. He also said that creative environments have, have, a, uh, uh, have a limited life. They live about 15 years on the average. Some, some of them live some, some longer. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, the other day I have reread, and not, uh, I have read it very long time ago, somebody sent me uh, the s advice of a young scientist by Ramon y Cajal, uh, the great Spanish, uh, who es essentially made the histology of the nervous system in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, for which he got the Nobel Prize. And he was a lonely giant. 
uh, in a country where science was very little cultivated. He has written uh, advice to a young investigator. And I reread it, and it's amazing, because all the poisons are there, and they are all the poisons of today. And everything that he says is in the same way in our society, which is also so different. Uh, the interesting difference is that he says that the three leading countries in science are England, France, and Germany. The United States are not mentioned because it's not a leading country at this time, the end of the 19th century. It was a small, unimportant country, actually, and most of the science, all of the science was done in Europe. So how come that the US, in a few decades, is bypassing everybody and becoming the leading country in the world? And I think it's essentially the sociology, because um, all the, the European universities were feudal, because the countries are feudal, and only the US was science populistic. And the notion that you are what you do, uh, that uh, has evolved in the United States, not, not what your position is. And also this great saying of the Danish biochemist Lindström Lang, who said that the greatest uh, achievement of the American Revolution was to vindicate the right of the, young, the right of the young scientists to ask a foolish question. I think that is very true. Now, my last point uh, concerns Hungary. I am born in Hungary. I left the country when I was 19. And uh, uh, I left, uh, and then many, many years later, I got to know Leo Szilard, the physicist, very well. And he told me the story that he left, also when he was 19, this was just after the First World War, he was sitting on a train, and opposite to him was an old peasant sitting. And the old peasant noticed that the young man is very depressed, so he said, why are you so sad, young man? And he said, I'm leaving the country, and probably forever. So the old peasant looked at him and says, you will be happy remembering this day all your life. <laughs> and this was a, a Hungarian, American, or Canadian rather, who was coming home for a visit. And that's the way I feel about Hungary. Uh, I love the language, I love the culture, but I don't love the country. Uh, why not? Uh, in uh, Nature magazine, in the year 2000, there was a millennium essay and on the top of that essay was a picture of the Royal Castle in Budapest. Uh, and it said that the science of the 20th century was born in Hungary. So what was the article about? It was about 10 Hungarian, as the article said, Hungarian mathematicians and physicists. Leo Szilard and Teller and Erdős and Wigner and von Neumann and so on. Now it said that the great Hungarian mathematicians and physicists, well, there's just one problem of that statement. All of them, without exception, were Jewish. And most of them left the country because of the numerous clauses. And Hungary has the pride of having been the first country in the world to make anti-Semitic legislation in the 1920s when they introduced numerous clauses. And that made some of these uh, great mathematicians and physicists what they have become. Not only that, there was a good educational system in Hungary established by a minister of culture whose name was Kuno Klebersberg in the 19th century was extremely foresighted. And actually a tradition in the gymnasia where the mathematics teacher was very important and where the boys were competing in uh, doing good mathematics and solving problems. Uh, years ago in Stockholm, I was sitting next to a gentleman at a dinner whom I did not know. So I say to him, who are you? He says, I am the rector of the University of Economics in Stockholm. So I said, what is your field? He said, mathematics. He was about 50 years old. So I said, are you still doing creative mathematics? He said, no, it's impossible. After the age of 30, you cannot do creative mathematics. So I said, well, how about Lippold Feyer, the doyen of the Hungarian mathematicians who made creative mathematics after 80? Oh, he was an exception. He was a marvel. And I said, and what about the Ries brothers? Uh, one of them, professor of mathematics in Hungary, the other in Sweden. Great mathematicians after 70. said, oh, well, there, is no, there was no one like them. So and this, I, said, I said, how about Erdős, who is a world name in mathematics, uh, still traveling around the world. Oh, but there was nobody like Erdős. <laughs> so these were all Hungarian Jews. Now, uh, what made them to continue creating mathematics after the age of 50 and much beyond? I think it's, again, sociological. Uh, in Hungary, uh, if you became a full professor uh, during the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, it was piercing the class barrier. 
you became in a totally different category, and your wife got a different diet. Right? You were regarded in a totally different way. And the young mathematicians in the 20s and 30s were outstanding, did achieve that, and they were the only ones, numerous classes or not, who got the full professorships because of their achievements. Because in mathematics, there is a pecking order, and everybody knows what the pecking order is, and there is no bluffing. So uh, due to mathematics, they could pierce the social order. A Swedish mathematician or a mathematician in any free democratic country gets pretty tired after the age of 30. It's difficult to do mathematics alone, and the only people who understand you are usually your competitors. And of course, if you are offered, offered a position like rector or chancellor and so on, you will take it. So again, I think creativity is highly linked to motivation, as it always is. Uh, my last example is from the food industry. Uh, as you know, uh, Hungary is leading still in certain branches of the food industry. Salami, just think of salami. But most of the products of the food industry in which Hungary is leading are coming, are, are related to, to pigs. So how come, why pigs? Because the Turks occupied the country for 200 years and they took all the cattle and uh, all the goats and the sheep and they left the pigs. So the Hungarian industry became big because of that. Uh, and in the same way, I, I think this Hungarian Jewish uh, uh, physicist and mathematics uh, remained highly creative all their lives because that's what made them, and there were no other attractions in life. So I don't know whether and how you use these lessons in creativity. I just want to say that the sociology of the scientist is extremely important. And uh, no one describes the atmosphere of the Pasteur Institute, I will quote it in detail tomorrow, better than Francois Jacob, uh, who just really described the secret of what made the Institute creative. And let's discuss that tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, now, George Klein has introduced a whole new dimension into this discussion of excellence. I could say not, not just one dimension, but a multidimensional uh, aspect of this, of this phenomenon, putting it to a sociological, historical, and even anthropological uh, context. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, such... A anecdotal, as he calls them, but very serious anecdotal uh, exceptions, events will uh, will continue even in our age. I think that Edouard started uh, something like that when he mentioned uh, the Landau Institute, and when you mention uh, Ramon Cajal, that immediately reminds us of the outstanding, outstanding physicists and mathematicians who emerge in, in Indian society, there's nothing with more extreme contrast to their environment than, than Raman. Uh, or Chandrasekhar was then, uh, he emigrated and, and yes, all, all those. But when we talk about science policy, uh, we mean something much more uh, secular, yeah? Uh, because uh, uh, after all, there are institutions there are governments, there is a political system, and the question is, for them, uh, how to allocate funds. And this is what, what uh, science policy is about. And fortunately, irrespective of what they do, there will be stars. But, we, but how do you maintain a, a good overall system? And we had here uh, several presentations now and in the morning, and uh, there is, uh, when I emphasize this, uh, this uh, issue of structure, uh, there is one striking difference, maybe two extremes. In the one case, uh, the, the question is, how, what do you do with public money to, to, to advance uh, scientific research? In one case, you have whole institutions, like the WPI like the institution that Professor uh, uh, Nielsen mentioned, uh, like the uh, Max Planck Institutes. So you have a whole them and you uh, fund them and they have a certain amount of, of, uh, uh, of independence in maintaining their... On the other hand, you choose an individual or a group 
within an existing institution, like the i program, like the Belgian system that I mentioned, like the FG has been doing in Germany. Uh, also in France, you have both the cohabitate. So uh, maybe as first, and if uh, either the panelists or anybody else would like, but very briefly, to respond to these two, whatever you want, advantage, disadvantage, is it a poison? Is one of them a poison that you will mention tomorrow? So is anybody that wants to uh, address this question uh, from the audience here? Yes. Well, I think, as you said, the, the difference between the various uh, well, excellence centers was uh, the size. Uh, that was the amount of money that was uh, put into it. I think the i was probably the one that has least money to, to each individual, and, and, and uh, Japan was probably the one with the highest amount. I think what, 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 what we need is uh, a combination of the two. We have to really focus on the talent. So I think they can get so big that there's a big group of people that get the money, but it's difficult to identify the talent in there. So I think if I should put sort of a recommendation, I think sort of a, 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 the funding should be on a level where a single person can be singled out and can work with this money. And then uh, potentially on basis of that, you can establish institutions like, for example, I mean, I presented, that is a lot of individual funds. It's not a big fund for one center. It's individual funds, so that could be pooled by different sm smaller funds to, 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 to uh, individuals. I think individual is uh, the word here. Okay. Zev, you want to respond? I was also thinking about something that was excellent. One moment, Zev. A micro is coming. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, centers of excellence, in particular multidisciplinary, is in the mode. You can't avoid it. You have to do it in order you to make uh, a promotion. But on a more fundamental level, if you look at science, science grows at the same rate for 400 years, around doubles every 15 years, OK, uh, from the very beginning. I read some comment from 200 years ago that a scientist says, it's impossible. I cannot read anymore all the books that come out in science. So everybody felt the, the modernity of science. It grows very fast. Now, the cost of science grows at the same rate, very, very fast. If it gro continues to grow at this rate, in a number of years, it will surpass the GDP of the world. So it is inconceivable that it will grow at the same rate as it does now. It has to flatten out. Uh, if that is the case, then how you promote progress? There it comes back what, what you said, and, and what, what you said, how you identify the stars, really, which does not require massive investment in large groups, but identify who really are the promoters, which cost a lot less and perhaps makes more progress. I, Hungary is a good example that they could do it, in a sense, but you mentioned a social, so, sociological effect. One thing that was there, that the Jewish community in, in, in Budapest was well-to-do and very interested in science. So everything that happened in high schools immediately got a public reaction, and that encouraged good people. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the graduates went to the German good university and had freedom to, to develop. But, but I think it's, a, oh, it's, a, it's an un, I don't know what the answer is, how you really promote uh, starts so that you don't invest massive amounts of money that we are not going to have in 20, 50, 20, or 30 years to promote science. You want to respond? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have to add something to what I said about this. Uh, when I was a student in gymnasium in Hungary, uh, first of all, let me say that once I had to lecture for Swedish gymnasium teachers, and uh, one of them says that what fantastic schools you must have had in Hungary because you have been educated in the humanities and in the sciences, and you keep this interest all your life. And we don't have these schools because the government doesn't invest, etc. So I said, good schools, good teachers. We had terrible schools. We had corrupt teachers. They were <laughs> underpaid uh, elderly gentlemen who lost all interest in the subject, with one great exception only in my school. But there was an atmosphere of learning and of excellence but they came through our peers, the other boys, and they, it filtered down from this incredible atmosphere in the triangle of Vienna, Prague, and Budapest at the turn of the century. And what was very important is that we, saying 
the boys who were interested in anything cultural, respected each other depending on what the other guy, whether the other guy was really interested in what he was doing. Then it didn't matter whether it was biology or literature or arts or, or chess playing. Uh, the important thing is that he was interested in something serious. And even more importantly, the girls respected the boys which were in, who were interested in something serious. <laughs> now, this filtered down. It was an atmosphere. It was a consensus. It was nothing that can be imposed on society. Either it is there or it is not there. And you cannot do it by will. You can only establish it by trying to show uh, the people how wonderful it is. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. The microphone, please. I have one question to all the participants who spoke about the different I Corps in the different countries. Nobody mentioned humanities except for the Israeli I Corps. Could you explain to me why there was no interest? or desire to create i corps in France, Denmark, Germany, or Japan? In humanities. Oh. Okay. Well, at least I only gave um, I think the humanity and social science is the very basis for understanding our life and society. But at the present, uh, humanity and social science in Japan doesn't need so much money. And so WPI program, it's really uh, putting a large amount of money to, to encourage science. And I, did, I don't say social science humanity is not a target, but it's, at the present, it's not excluded. So in the future, maybe we think to have science and humanity centers. We'll get. Well, well, just a comment. I, I only reflected on two examples. Uh, so th this uh, uh, Danish National Research Foundation also funds uh, uh, centers of excellence in humanities and social sciences. So, so they're pr definitely present and also put up to some priority. Um, I'm sorry, I had to take a couple of shortcuts in order to uh, stay within the time limit. Of the 40, 43 clusters of excellence, at least six or seven are in the humanities. And of the 40-odd um, um, graduate schools, almost a quarter are in the humanities and social sciences. Mm -hmm. So when I said competition across all disciplines, I really meant all disciplines. Well, this morning I probably flashed too quickly the figures, but I read again my transparency. There are 26% of the laboratories of excellence in the field of social sciences and humanities, more than like a quarter, like in Germany. Yes. Clyde, you said that the reason for the United States to take over so fast was the social structure. That's certainly true. But was the other important element the immigrants from Europe, the Jewish immigrants from Europe? Uh, speaking about the humanities, Speaking about the humanities. He's answering you. Yes. Uh, Sigmund Freud considered himself a doctor and a natural scientist, yet he had an enormous respect for literature. And he always pointed out that it's the great novelists, a young uh, psychologist should read, because that's where, where there is all the information and all the learning. And the respect uh, for the humanities is very, also very high in Europe. Salvador Eluria, uh, one of the founders of modern molecular biology, uh, an Italian-American, he gave a course at MIT uh, on existential philosophy uh, to the students of molecular biology because he said that uh, the, uh, all the elements of the trade, they will learn anyway. There is no problem with that. What they will not learn is philosophy and literature, and they have to learn it early if it is going to influence them all their lives. And I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I should mention uh, in Japan we have a center of excellence initiative, uh, which is a small amount of money, about two thirds of WPI. In this COE program, we have humanity and social sciences.
question I would have liked to ask Professor Tustenberg after his lecture was whether there were critics of the I cause and um, uh, what their arguments were. Some of the major critics of the German Excellence Initiative were in the humanities, who said that humanities do not need this size of scientific enterprise, and um, they would be far happier if, if they got their money in smaller amounts and distributed. Again, there's an argument about creative atmosphere. Uh, hum humanity is saying that this is just too big for them, they can't find a concept, and so on. They entered the competition with Verve all the same, and they were quite successful all the same. But the debate uh, continues. Uh, whether, in fact, this sort of concentration is the right way to bring about creative science. Well, it's Professor Trachtenberg is not here. Neither is, uh, uh, who was he? Uh, Shimon Yankilevich is here. I can Everybody at least... She's here. What? We are small. Yeah. Ah. Is that? Yeah. Well, of course, uh, we got uh, many reactions uh, on the ICOR initiative and um, also criticism. But um, let me refer to what you mentioned about the humanities. It was indeed a, um, there was a cont controversy, and I think uh, Professor Trachtenberg did mention it uh, briefly. Um, what, is the right, um, what is the right way to uh, treat humanities in this context, whether they are ripe? Uh, to even write such uh, proposals, which include various researchers from various institutions, um, whether this is the right modus operandi for, uh, for humanities. And um, it was sort of an experiment. We did have discussions on this. And I see Professor Benny Kaidar. He will be here tomorrow. It will so, be discussed tomorrow. So we did discuss this. He was one of the participants. We had international uh, participants uh, in the humanities. It was also organized by Yad and Adib, which is here. Um, and we considered various options. Some of the ideas was to try smaller, to take more groups and give them money for just the first year, and then see how they progress and pick from them the ones that would continue toward the centers. Um, eventually, there were arguments both ways, and we decided to go about the same manner as uh, the regular i -Cors. But of course, they get a large, a smaller budget because they have different needs and less research infrastructures and so on. And uh, we've seen a very good uh, um, response in the scientific community within the humanities and social sciences uh, to this uh, call for proposals. And in the end, uh, the proposals that we received were very good in international standards as evaluated by the international committees. So we're yet to see. I mean, they just about to start operating. We're yet to see how it will uh, work. But uh, we are very optimistic. Now, since you asked about uh, points of criticism, uh, let me uh, quote what I hear from my colleagues here. Because uh, for in the ICOS pro program, uh, certain topics first are selected. Now, all those topics cover research that is the core of every university research. If you take uh, some topics in uh, uh, climate research, brain research, uh, uh, basic bio life scientific topics, physics, every university has to have that. But then uh, the rules say that there is only one ICOR selected in every single topic. So what happens is that usually the university system in Israel, when that was announced, split up into two competing teams would be in, in different topics, there were, this was other teaming up. And then the decision was always not by knockout. It is by points, but sometimes very delicate points. It's not clear under different mood this could be done. So the others who do not get it, that is the criticism. Does it mean that you should not do or that brain research in other universities that in that particular so this is a serious point. Uh, on the other hand, I still approve that system very much. It made, it injected a lot of, I mean, significant new funds into our systems. And how uh, the, the 
system copes with that, this will be the topic of tomorrow's discussion when the will, you will have a whole panel addressing these issues. Yes. Uh, from the audience and then. Uh, uh, Jesse Osabel from Rockefeller University in the US. And I, I, I would just like to make a couple of comments from a US perspective. Um, this, the discussion today has emphasized the universities, but looking at the history of science and the history of technology in the US over the last hundred years, in fact, uh, there has also been incredible creativity within, within industry and also within government laboratories. Perhaps the single most creative laboratory in the United States during the 20th century was the AT&T Bell Laboratories under the subjection of the uh, monopoly telephone company. Uh, the IBM research labs are not too far behind and continue very creatively. And there have been other examples, RCA, uh, General Electric at various times. And now the Google labs are probably as creative, as excellent as uh, MIT and Caltech and all the universities put together. And the Microsoft labs are also so outstanding. So I think we might want to think uh, tomorrow a little bit also about the atmosphere, what makes creativity and excellence also in, in private industry. And some of these were sustained over many, many decades, longer than the 10 to 15 years that have been mentioned. The government laboratories, on the other hand, I think fit this model of a short period of greatness. And the laboratories like the Oak Ridge National Lab or Los Alamos uh, or Livermore had these short intervals of excellence and then became heavily bureaucratized. And most of the national labs have not continued to succeed. We could discuss the NIH labs uh, in the, uh, uh, which have continued now for a long time, but most people would say also they have fallen behind uh, the, the universities. Uh, so so uh, one subject for tomorrow, I think, is whether we should only speak of universities when we speak of excellence in science, or we should look more broadly. Uh, the, the second comment is uh, in reaction to Edouard's uh, uh, closing quote from Bruce Alberts, uh, my fellow American. But I think it's also worth noting that uh, with the possible exception of Israel, the US remains far the most religious of all the, most, of the, all the major countries. And it's not at all clear to me that ha being part of a very religious society rather than a very rational society is in fact negative for science or excellence in science. And I personally think that uh, the two may to go together. One shouldn't forget that Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, not to mention Oxford and Cambridge and so forth, all began as theological schools. And there is still a kind of, it, many of the private American universities, there is still a kind of, I would say, a kind of religious culture. Uh, and uh, so, so I, I think we, we shouldn't jump too quickly, at least in the case of the United States, to a conclusion that a complete secularization of the society is in fact, would in fact benefit science. Thank you. Yes, but that doesn't mean it may flourish in a society in which many other people are driven by irrational, what we would call irrational beliefs. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. First of all, uh, I know lots of American scientists, friends. Most of the time, I have no idea whether they are religious or not religious. And I don't think this is never, I've never seen this question being raised working in science. Number two, uh, you should look at our poor fellow scientists working in countries like Tunisia and Egypt nowadays and how difficult it is in society in which Islamic power is trying to impose itself against science. There is a, a book published just last week in French by a Tunisian physicist, Mrs. Shafi, called La Science Voilée, the Veiled Science. I recommend whenever it's translated into English that maybe you, you put your judgment of religious segment of the Israeli society. 
we are considering a sociological problem. We are not considering a religious problem. Because the tradition in this part of society is to provide very, I would say, as you use a strong word, retarded education to the uh, to their young generation. And also the distribution of labor among this part, this society, is very, very different. And this part of society, together with a large number of the Arabic society, amounts to about 20, 25 percent of our population. So this is a very serious problem, which has nothing to do with religious beliefs, but rather with sociological, social issues. Yes, so I understand that, and there may be a whole set of economic issues having to do with Precise. aging population, or having Precise. to do with the fraction of the population that doesn't work. But I think there's a different issue about whether different belief systems can in fact coexist in the society, and it may actually be, for reasons that we don't understand very well, it may actually be that science at least in the case of the U.S., uh, exists. They may be in parallel universes, but maybe it's healthy that they're both there. So I, I just don't think we should jump to the conclusion. I don't. I don't agree with Bruce Alberts, and I don't think we should just accept his statement without critically thinking about it. Okay. Do we want to discuss this point, or do we go to no, no, no? Because on this point, uh, on this point, just to mention when we talk about when you mention. I, I'd come from the means to your defense, yes? Because uh, when one talks about science and religion, the way Max Planck did talk about science and religion, the way Albert Einstein did talk about science and religion, and the whole generation of outstanding scientists at the beginning of the 20th century, there's nothing to do with this kind of practicing religion. There is a certain atmosphere of the certain kind of religiosity. Gerald Holton from Harvard, the great pioneer of Einstein's scholarship, referred to Einstein's fusion of science and religion as his third paradise. And we had a whole discussion on that last week with Joshua in Germany. And there is, see, that there are different contexts to the word religion. There is a certain admiration of the unity of nature, like the, the, the religion of Spinoza, which has nothing to do with practicing religion of the Islam or even of the priests and the rabbis. Yeah? This, is, this, is a, this is an attitude. But I suggest, you see, I suggest that we drop this point now. Yeah? I just wanted to come to your defense because everybody was attacking you, so. <laughs> themselves as devoutly religious. So there may be some, I think we should just think in a more nuanced way about okay. the situation. Well, there was a center of excellence in holiness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Professor Nielsen. Yeah, so, so I'll not continue with this. I think actually the only thing that I want to comment on this society, uh, uh, sociological thing was your comment uh, that your client, uh, that uh, if there was no other attractions in life, then science was good. Or was it something like that you said with the school system? No, what I want to address is more uh, this issue of private uh, companies, uh, science there, and also private funds. I don't know what, whether you see that, but at least in Denmark, we have a hugely increasing uh, number of funds coming in from private uh, industries. We have uh, $100 million centers established by private funds. And that's also an issue to, to, to look into when you talk about what, what you talked about before, thematic areas. You want to do, go, go into certain areas and make a centers of excellence there. Definitely, the private fund that is coming in is sort of going in that direction. And I think this is, at least in our society, is extremely important right now. Right. No, 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 I hear. If there is, if nobody really feels an urge to ask a question, to voice an objection, 
or to make any remark, then we shall adjourn this meeting. And thank you for my panelists here. And thank you for, uh, to everybody who asked questions, who expressed such an interest in what was said here. And we shall meet again tomorrow.